This is exciting for us. Thank you all for coming out. Um, as Dennis mentioned, this is the second of our coffee shop breakfast series event, talking about employer brand. And there's a lot of ground to cover. It's um, something that we believe is pretty important, aligning your HR and marketing departments. You've built this great employer brand, so now what do we do with it? So I'm going to dive right in. First time, this is kind of a, a flashback to the first event. We did all of this work to define your employer brand, define it in a way that's authentic to you, right? Um, as Dennis mentioned, if you weren't here for that, you can see a video of the, the presentation on our website. We also have an ebook you can download um, if you really want to dig into this. But the question we want to ask today is, we've done all of this work. We've built an authentic employer brand. It's true to who you are as a company. Now, how do we make sure all of that work is going to be worth it? Because what we do next, this can really determine whether this employer brand really thrives and lives on and realizes its potential, or does it kind of just fade away like just another initiative? And so obviously we want this thing to live on. We want it to realize its full potential. We want it to really help us improve our business. So that means somebody needs to own it, right? And so your mind uh, automatically goes to what department am I going to put this under? Companies love to, because it makes sense, take these initiatives, put them under the direction of a single department. And so that probably is going to go under one of two places. Maybe it goes under the purview of marketing. This makes a lot of sense because marketing folks, they're professional communicators, right? And after all, this is called an employer brand. Um, in our experience, maybe it's even a little more common for this to be under the responsibility of human resources. And this, this makes a lot of sense too. Human resources, they are the people who are custodians of that employer-employee relationship, right? Um, everything they're doing is about building a team that's going to behave a certain way to deliver what you do. So this makes a lot of sense. This is very logical. This is how companies tend to work. but from our perspective, this also creates a problem. And so the problem this creates is really when you get right down to it, employer brand, any brand, really is about two things. It's about who you are and how you communicate it. And so maybe the simplest way I can think of to underscore the, the issue is a concept maybe you're familiar with called the say-do ratio. So this, simply put, is just the relationship between the degree to which what you say about yourself and what you do, what people actually experience, the degree to which that matches up. And so obviously you want this to be a one-to-one -one ratio. You want what you say and what you do to be equal. It's all about building trust. It's about authenticity. And you can't separate those two sides of this equation. Now, we would argue that the same exact thing is true of marketing and human resources. Because the interesting thing is that this say-do ratio, you can map this more or less directly to marketing and HR. So marketing is out in the world making promises about what you can expect when you interact with your company. HR is building and developing the team that's going to deliver on those promises. So marketing makes the promises, HR builds the team, what you say holds you accountable to what you do, what you do determines what you can authentically say. So there's this interdependent relationship going on here. And now this is important to us. We're a marketing firm, we're not HR consultants. Um, but this is important to us because the approach that we take to marketing is that marketing really can't live in isolation. This is the lens through which we view the world of marketing. This is what we call the customer experience ecosystem. And what you're looking at here is the customer experience, that's the target that we're trying to hit. All marketing and branding really is about creating a great customer experience. The brand, that's making promises of what that experience will be, but we know that we can't really do authentic marketing 
Um, it's not going to really sound authentic if the people inside the organization are not on board and are not delivering on exactly what we're promising. So we need to have that one-to-one -one ratio. So that's why we believe that marketing and HR are inseparable in a lot of ways. They really are two sides of the same coin. They need to be working together on your employer brand. Now, I think that sounds pretty great. That sounds good in theory. Uh, there's a little bit of, of, of inference we're making here. What really is at stake, though? What's going to happen if we don't do this, if we don't get marketing and HR working together? For an extreme example, what do you think of when you think of Wells Fargo? This was their messaging in 2016. They were saying, together we'll go far. It was all built on heritage and optimism and caring for people, working together to make your, your dreams come true, right? They, at the time, thanks to the uh, Internet Archive, you can go back and see what they were saying on their website at the time. They had a values page talking about ethics, talking about caring for customers, doing what's right for customers. They expounded upon the virtues of behaving ethically, valuing what's right in everything. They talked about wanting their team to feel proud of what they do uh, because they go the extra mile to do what's right in all circumstances. And then in late 2016, this happened. It turned out, it came to light, that Wells Fargo had fired over uh, 5,000 people um, because they had built this culture of competition and insanely aggressive sales goals that led people to engage in all sorts of deceitful, illegal practices. They opened more than a million and a half fraudulent accounts in people's names without their knowing. Obviously, this was a very bad thing. So it became very clear that what Wells Fargo was out in the world saying and what they were actually doing within the company couldn't have been more different. Now I know I said this was an extreme example. I know that this maybe is an unfair example because Wells Fargo, they obviously had some things bigger than just HR and marketing not being in alignment going on. Um, but it's all about the say-do ratio. It's all about what you say and what you do matching. And the same kind of thing can happen on a much smaller scale maybe, but when you don't have HR and marketing working together, when you don't have those two sides equaling each other out, all sorts of things that can happen can happen that can damage your brand. So it may not show up, it may not show up in scandals and, and fines and things, but it's going to damage your reputation. None of us thinks about Wells Fargo the same way today as we did two years ago, probably. So if it doesn't show up in scandals and fines and government intervention and, and things like that, how does this show up? Well, a lack of alignment between marketing and HR can show up in things like confusion and apathy and disengagement. It can show up in people, employees, who couldn't tell you, or anyone else for that matter, what your company really stands for. It can show up as inauthentic marketing. This is something that human beings are just kind of attuned to, right? We can sniff out inauthenticity like bloodhounds. And so, I mean, think about this. Last year, Wells Fargo, not to pick on them too much, but they updated their marketing campaign with a tagline, established 1852, reestablished 2018. And they had these really well done commercials, really great advertisement, all about um, earning back trust and recommitting and fixing what went wrong. And it's all great, but with what you know about what was happening inside the company, how authentic does that feel? Trust is a hard thing to win back. And then the, the third thing here is that a disconnect between marketing and HR, mismatch between what you're saying and what you're doing, especially when it comes to employer brand. If employees are seeing one thing and hearing and, and experiencing something else can result in low engagement. And low engagement, you know, there's tons of information about this and how it affects your company. Basically, the long and short of it is companies with low engagement do not perform as well as highly engaged companies. And this in this context, this is a really important metric, I think. Engagement is important because 
Engagement comes from employees knowing and understanding who you are as a company and connecting with that and connecting their specific role in delivering on that, that purpose. So it's really, it's the intersection of your overall vision and what you're saying and what you're doing. It's, um, it's both sides of the equation. It's both the brand and the behavior, both the say and the do. And so the flip side of engagement is if you have high engagement, great things can happen. You have fewer incidents of quality, fewer incidents of, of safety incidents, um, higher productivity, higher sales, lower turnover, higher profitability, all sorts of great things happen. So that problem that we create when we take our employer brand and try to fit it into a box called marketing or a box called human resources is that essentially we take what is kind of naturally an interdependent relationship and we drive a wedge in the middle of it. So these are things that can't be separated. Marketing is out there communicating what, to ex what your experience is going to be. HR is building the team that delivers that experience. And it's cyclical too. Marketing creating a great customer experience or communicating a great customer experience. That feeds back into the company that energizes people. That helps you attract greater, uh, better talent. All of those things, they work together. These are two, two sides of the same coin. They complete one another. You. So, even Tom Cruise wants us to get our HR and marketing in alignment. So, how should we go about doing that? So, what we put together here is kind of a five step roadmap for how to get marketing and HR working together. And then, once you do have them working together, what you can do together to really activate your employer brand and make it work for you. Some of these things are a little meatier than others. This is, this is a pretty big topic. Um, so some of this I'm gonna go into a little more detail on and some of this we're gonna kinda just buzz the tower a little bit. But overall, this is a, a pretty solid roadmap. And I should mention too that um, we've again created an ebook that goes into a lot of detail on this. So if you find value in this and wanna really dig into it, definitely encourage you to, to look at that ebook and we're gonna send that pretty much right when we're done here. So you'll all receive that. All right, so step one, your employer brand is a living thing. It's living and changing and breathing and somebody needs to keep it alive and every living thing needs a habitat. So that's what we wanna do. We wanna create the environment where collaboration between marketing and HR can happen and can really thrive. First step on that, that journey really is to get top leadership on board. It's, frankly, this is gonna be really difficult to do if top leadership isn't on board, a lot harder than it has to be. And so that means top leadership, the CEO and the leadership team and whoever, really needs to understand why it's important to get marketing and HR uh, working together, why it's important to think a little bit differently about how those departments interact or don't, thinking a little bit differently about the experience as a whole, and then beyond that, actively nurturing an, an environment where this kind of collaboration can happen. The second thing, and this sounds really, really elementary and really obvious, but just have meetings together. Um, we recognize that this can be tough in practice depending on the size of the company and depending on all sorts of things, you know. Sometimes it's just logistics or it's habits or maybe it's just countercultural. Maybe it's something that is, is not what your company has ever been used to or would ever be used to. But the value in doing this is it's hard to get anywhere with your employer brand if you're not having frequent face-to-face -face conversations across the aisle between HR and marketing. Sharing your goals, sharing your challenges, talking about those things in the context of the company's overall vision and strategy. And so this is not something that we have to bite off all at once. We would say just start small, maybe every month or every quarter. Get those teams together, talk about your goals, talk about your challenges. Um, just share your experiences. And you know, you may find this energizing because sometimes just 
having somebody else's perspective on your, your challenges is energizing. Sometimes it can be energizing to stretch your thinking and think about somebody else's goals and their challenges. And you may even find that you really enjoy doing this and you want to do more of it, in which case we would say just go for it. This in practicality can be difficult if you're thinking of creating a team, but we would suggest maybe consider the possibility of what would happen if you created a team with HR people and marketing people dedicated to employer brand, dedicated to culture and engagement and employee communication and the experience in general. This is an approach that plenty of companies have taken. It's been very successful. Southwest Airlines is sort of an example of this. They've done something similar to great effect. Closer to home, this is pretty much the approach that they took at Breakthrough Fuel. Uh, they don't have a traditional HR department or marketing department. They have one team that um, is responsible for both the internal and the external experience, which obviously we think is a great idea, um, but why they took that approach is, is really what underscores its value, and I think, I think it pays to hear what uh, Craig Dickman has to say. I've always found it fascinating and frustrating that you'd see organizations that would talk about themselves in the marketplace one way and try to represent who they were mm -hmm. and then behave very, very differently inside the organization. So we've created something we call the Breakthrough Experience. So the breakthrough experience for us is, you know, what does it mean to interact with breakthrough on any level, from the market back to, to the core company? And so we have one team that does all of the go-to-market, marketing work, anything that we're doing in the marketplace around the brand. And that same team brings the brand into the people process and kind of who we are, and it creates, you know, a real continual feel of who we are. And I think that alignment is so important and is one of the reasons why, you know, it's easy to, 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 uh, to connect the people with the work. All right. So now we've created an environment where HR and marketing can collaborate. Now we want to start building a strategy. So our first suggestion here is when you start approaching a strategy for how to really bring your, your employer brand to life, you really need to understand who you're talking to. And so in marketing, we might use personas. Because the idea behind a persona is you want to build as complete a picture as you can of who you're talking to. The more specific we can be about um, who we're trying to reach, the better our chances of connecting with them emotionally. And so we want to build out a description of the kinds of people that we need to reach with messaging about our employer brand. And that's, you know, what is their stage of life? What do they care about? What do they believe in? This is an example of, of something that we've used in the past to build out personas. And you know, there's a million different ways you can do this. If you Google marketing personas, you'll see all sorts of great examples. Um, we did actually provide this example to you as a handout in case you find value in this. Um, but the idea here is that we want to create personas that give us as, as good a picture as we can of who we're talking to and how they're going to need to be reached so that we can tailor messaging to them. Now you're going to want to create personas at the very least for current employees and candidates. In reality though, you're going to have more personas than that. So this, honestly, this is a lot of work, um, but it's, it's work that's worth it. So for example, Recruitment personas, you might need to create a persona for corporate positions and create a persona for, uh, you know, assembly plant position. You might want to create personas for young talent or more seasoned employees, create personas for your current employees of different life stages, those kinds of things. This is a great time for HR and marketing to come together and really talk about what are all the audiences we need to try to reach and then let's prioritize them and kind of, you know, whittle it down to the few most important ones and build out these personas. Once you know who you're talking to, now we need to, to figure out where can we reach them? Where do we want to find them within their daily lives? So the way that we would do that uh, from a, mar a marketing perspective is to map out the customer journey. This is something that um, is very helpful because it shows us where a customer is and what they're experiencing at every stage 
in their relationship with your company, from when they first hear about you to when they start considering you as an option to making a purchase and so on. Now, your employees and candidates, they're customers too, just a slightly different kind. And they go through a very similar journey. So this also is a handout for you to, to take home but we can map their journey exactly the same way. And so the idea here is to look at every stage where you might uh, find out about your company or find out about jobs and then how they're considering you, how they're researching you, all of those things. And the point is we want to find touch points at every one of these stages. We're looking to uncover opportunities where we can interrupt people with messaging, basically. So this is a, a an exercise that's gonna require asking a lot of questions, really digging in, looking at what are those personas, how are they spending their time, what are they looking for, what are they searching for, what are they looking at, and really think about three things. What are they seeing at all of those stages? What are they hearing and what are they feeling? And so if we were filling this out for a candidate in the awareness stage, you know, you might find out about your company through LinkedIn or through Facebook or through a friend who works for you. And then you get interested and so you start looking into it further. You're considering, you're evaluating. Maybe you're asking a bunch of questions on Facebook. Have you heard of this company? What do you think about it? You're looking up reviews on Glassdoor. You're going to the website. You're poking around their, their careers page, trying to get this picture, as complete a picture as you can of what this company is really like. So when we fill this out and we understand where people are spending their time, then we can meet them with communication. And this is important. Again, this is hard work, but this is important because it leads to the next thing, which is to now we can drill down and create an actual communications plan. Communications plans don't need to be pretty. Um, ours are just documents, generally. But the point of this, and this kind of is the biggest part, this is where you are actually defining actions that will directly impact your reputation as an employer. And so in practice, this ends up being kind of just a, a big uh, comprehensive list of tactics within an overall strategy for reaching the people you want to communicate with. So you need to start by agreeing on objectives. You need to know what you're trying to accomplish specifically. Refer to those personas. Those are going to help guide when you start prioritizing what are the most important things we want to put our efforts towards. Look at that employee journey map. That's going to uncover those opportunities and hopefully a lot of opportunities you may not otherwise have thought of for how to reach people with messaging. And then the, the last bit of advice is to think in an omni-channel way. This is, this is you know, the marketing term for don't just use the, the old standbys. If you have a bulletin board in the break room for your employees, that's a great place to put messaging, but that's not the only place to put messaging. So think about different ways to do that. Think in terms of customer marketing and the great campaigns you've ever seen. Um, you know, an example of this, a while back, we had created a campaign for Digger's Hotline for one of the, the energy utilities. So, you know, you call 811 before you dig, right? The idea was we need to find people when they're in a mindset where they have this specific need, they're going to start a project, they need to dig, how can we reach them with this message? So what we did was we created some floor graphics that looked like a hole in the ground and they had 811 messaging, call before you dig, and we placed those at home improvement stores right in front of the shovels. This is not a traditional way of marketing. Um, but this was a really effective way to find people at a, a point in time where they're trying to do a specific thing and stick messaging in front of them so that they remember to call before you dig. You can do the same kinds of things with employer um, communication, with employee communication and with recruitment communication. And so the last thing then, our last bit of advice in this section is consider using creative briefs. So a creative brief, this is something that we use to really focus our messaging. This, the whole point of a creative brief is to distill an objective, a specific objective, into emotionally engaging communication. So it's important to understand this is different from your positioning, 
and kind of those foundational brand elements that we put together, um, talking in the employer brand 101 session. This is when you have a very specific need, a very specific objective that we want to influence. So we use a five field creative brief. This again is available for you as a handout. I'm going to run through what those fields are real quickly. Um, and then I'll have an example because it's hard to kind of theorize about. So the first is a key fact. What's happening out in the world that creates a mindset within a customer? What is that mindset? If, if this thing is happening out in the world, then how do people think about that? What does that uh, create as a state of mind for them? We want to change that state of mind. We want to change that mindset. So our marketing goal is what do we want them to think instead of what they are currently thinking? And then we apply a strategic approach. Okay, what idea can we present to them? What can we show them that will help change that mindset? And then kind of the, the heart of the whole matter is the reason why. This is the emotional, compelling reason why they would believe that what we're showing them is true and can actually affect this change. So as an example, let's say we're filling this out for a company and we need a, a, a fake company, so we've decided this company is going to be an educational technology company. So what do they make? They make technologies for education. I'm very good at making fake companies. <laughs> the scenario is this company, they need to ramp up with summer help, right? So now we've got, we've got a situation. Okay, so what is our key fact? Oh, and I should mention, because we are highly creative people, this educational technology company is called Edutech. Okay, so the key fact, summer jobs are not hard to find, but fulfilling summer jobs are. Okay, we can work with that. I think we can believe that is relatively true. What problem does that create? What mindset does that create? Well, job seekers are used to summer jobs, leaving them bored, annoyed, and just happy to be done. Okay, I'll go with that. What is our goal? What do we want to change their mind to? We want to make job seekers believe that a, a summer job can be more than a necessary evil, it can be an opportunity to make a difference in people's lives. Okay, now we're getting a little, a little closer to something. How are we going to make them believe that? We're gonna demonstrate that working at Edutech means not only earning a great income, but spending your summer building brand new ways for students to learn, grow, and discover the world around them because your job may be temporary, but the impact you can make in your own life and in the lives of others won't be. Okay, now we're getting somewhere, I think. Now we're not just saying summer help wanted. Now we're actually playing on the emotions. We're actually speaking to the emotional connection. We're speaking to what's important to our audience. If this audience is college students who are looking for a summer job and are used to just phoning it in, but are also looking for purpose, this is a message that's gonna resonate with them a lot better than just saying, hey, we have jobs, come fill them. So the creative brief, this is gonna help you in a few ways. One is that it elevates the quality of your messaging. It turns it into more creative messaging and it becomes messaging that makes an emotional connection. The second is that it focuses you on a single action. We're not trying to, to be everything to everyone, we're not being too general. We're focused on, we have a very specific objective and we want to meet that. And then the third thing is when everybody does go off and, and execute different parts of this campaign, it's gonna keep you all in alignment. So maybe HR is gonna go off and write some job descriptions and marketing is gonna create some digital ads or something like that. They're all going to be working off of this same goal and the same approach and looking for this same reason why that's gonna make a strong connection with your, um, with your audiences. So the next two steps, these are kind of two sides of the same coin. This is all about designing the experience. So now we've created the environment, we've created a strategy. Now what do we need to do to actually design the experience that employees and candidates have with you? We talked a little bit about engagement surveys before. I'm sure you're familiar with these. Um, 
Now this is an opportunity with HR and marketing coming together to look at your engagement surveys just a little bit differently and really make them work for you. So it's, you know, sometimes engagement surveys become simply about increasing a score. What we want to do is analyze for trends, look for gaps, look for ways that we can impact the culture and the feeling um, within the organization. And then take it a step further and communicate with employees, here's what we've heard in these surveys, here's what we're going to do about it, and here's, here's how this is going to affect you. So it's more about taking this to actively make employees' lives better than it is about increasing the score. In fact, on a day like today, um, research has shown that if you just give your engagement survey on a sunnier day, you're gonna get higher scores than on like a cloudy, gloomy day. So, not so much about the scores, it's really about designing the experience. Second thing, bring the brand to your onboarding process. So, in the end of our previous session, or the, the end of the define phase of our, our employer brand, um, process, we talked about bringing all of the parts and pieces of your employer brand into a brand language manual. Now is the perfect time to use that brand language manual because this, it, it's a comprehensive story of who you are. It's meant to help people understand who you are and how you communicate your brand, which is exactly what you want employees to know. You want them to understand who you are and what your purpose is and how you're communicating it. So this can really help uh, guide their behavior and guide how they think about your company and how they represent your company. So you can use a brand language then to introduce employees to the experience you're creating and what their role means in delivering that experience. You can use it in a lot of other practical ways too. You can use it to guide, and you should use it, to guide internal communication to make sure it's all aligned, it's all staying aligned with that overall brand that you've created. And then use it to train recruiters as well. If you have a, a recruitment force out there telling the story to potential employees, you need to make sure that they really have that down. And so in this way we can make onboarding a little bit less about paperwork, a little bit less about procedures and things like that, and more about welcoming somebody into a family that believes specific things and wants to create a certain kind of experience. Think of it almost as a, a VIP welcome package to a high-end resort. You know, make this an experience that's going to foster emotional engagement from the very beginning. And then finally, nurture internal customer relationships the way you would look at external customer relationships. Um, with customers, you are used to paying constant, consistent attention to them because you want to build that relationship actively. Employees are possibly your most important relationship, so we have to use at least the same kind of effort we do in the sales process with our employees, which means consistent communication, constant communication, making sure they never feel forgotten, and think about things like, like you would think of in marketing, like reach and frequency. Are you reaching all of those people, even, even the people five states away, and frequency, how often are you in front of them, repeating those messages so that they understand and, and, and really buy in? On the candidate side of things, we want to design that experience as well. And so we talked about this a little bit um, last time, that probably your biggest and most important piece of messaging coming out of an employer brand initiative is updating your careers page. So I won't get too much into detail, but basically careers pages, they're kind of notoriously utilitarian and they're sparse and they're not terribly engaging. But this is such a good opportunity for you to show your personality and show your culture and tell your story uh, to the people who are trying to, to check you out, the people in that research phase who want to know more about you. So use your personas, use um, all the work that you've done in creating your employer brand, bring that voice and personality to the website, tell your story in a much more engaging way. Really sell what's in it for people who are coming there looking for a job. And along those same lines, rethink your job postings. A lot of job postings, they read like 
invitations to candidates to sell themselves to you, which is kind of the opposite of what we want, right? This is, this is your opportunity to say, here's why we're an awesome place to work. So we need to think about that differently. And it also, you know, it has to go beyond just information. This, again, needs to show your culture, needs to show your, your personality. So think of job postings less as job postings and more as ads that sell your culture. And when you do that, um, one quick word of warning, if you're thinking about this in terms of marketing and advertising, sometimes people fall into the trap of thinking that means I need to be clever. Clearer is always better than clever. Clever is a bonus if you can do it, if you can pull it off and still be clear, but don't sacrifice clarity for cleverness. Just a, a quick copywriter warning there for you. Make sure that you're grounding these in your USPs, your unique selling propositions, your unique buying propositions, your position. Bring out the personality. Use that creative brief to guide how you're writing these, these job posts. If you think of them as ads, then that creative brief is going to direct what kind of emotional connection you want to make through your job posting. And then even think about just other formats entirely. You know, maybe... Maybe text is not going to be the most effective way to create a job posting. Maybe you can consider doing a video job posting. You know, find somebody within your organization who can be good on camera and talk about the position a little bit and talk mostly about why it's awesome to work at your company, what your culture is like, and give people a much more immersive and engaging um, way to interact with your job postings. This is a really huge topic, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to gloss over this a lot, but consider content marketing. The, the value in content marketing is that you build trust and you build authority, and this is how people are looking for information. So if you want to be on somebody's radar, you can go a long way by creating useful, valuable content that they're going to find when they go to Google and start looking for jobs. So that allows you to play a part in that research phase, right? And great content, it does a lot of things. It positions you as an authority, it increases your visibility, it gets you found, and it's a great way to show your personality and culture. So don't be afraid to give away information for free. That's kind of the mantra of content marketing. What could that look like? It could look like a lot of different things. Maybe this is a, a, you know, a blog post or video series or other types of content. Maybe it's a, a long blog post about what our um, interview process looks like so that when people fresh out of college or going to Google saying, how on earth do I do a job interview, they're going to find your content specific to you and, and see you as an authority in that field. This may not result in a hire, but that, that trust that you build is pretty huge. And then finally, reassess your application process. Um, a lot of this is going to be happening online, and people who spend time online, which is everybody, they're used to seeing really, really great user experiences. So, you know, you think about the way that they shop and the way that they search for things. You want to make this as easy as you possibly can. The, the idea is to put yourself in that candidate's shoes and think about how can I remove barriers that would stop them from applying for a job. So if your application is too hard to find, if you have to click to too many places and search around for it, that's a barrier you want to remove. If on the extreme end of things, your, your application is not only hard to find, but it's a PDF and you have to download it and print it out and fill it out and then physically mail it back in, this is probably not a great experience to people who are used to being able to do things just at the, at the click of a mouse. And then step five, the last thing. Employer brand, any brand, is culture, really. So we want to activate the culture. We want to make it visible. We want to make it the star in our employer brand and in our messaging. So great culture can be a competitive advantage. Right, so we want to get those stories out into the world. Both candidates and customers want to know what you're really like as people. They want to see themselves in you. They want to see how you align with their beliefs, whether you're uh, going to be good to work with and fun to work with. Showcase your culture by finding great 
stories from within your team. Create that as messaging and put that out into the world. So that could look like, it could look like employee testimonials throughout your careers section, that could look like videos, that could look like blog posts. However that looks, the point is show your culture both in an employer brand context and in just a regular marketing context. And the additional benefit here is that this is gonna help build engagement because employees who are taking part in this, who are part of creating this content that goes out into the world and feeds into the success of your company, when they feel really connected to how that company is succeeding, it's, it's a very powerful thing. That's, that's where engagement comes from. Also consider sharing ownership of social media. This is very closely connected to the last point. Sometimes social media is more HR focused. Sometimes social media is strictly um, customer facing marketing. You wanna do both. 79% of job applicants look at social media when they're trying to figure out if they wanna take a job or when they're searching for a job. And this gives you a really great platform to give an organic inside look at your, at your culture and your people. You can get away with a lot, a lot more organic type of messaging on social media. So employees, that gives them a clear picture of who you are and what it's like to work with you. At the same time, seeing employees in your social media channels gives customers a great idea of what you really stand for and whether you're, you're good people that they wanna work with. This is the perfect place to do that kind of stuff. And then finally, foster brand advocacy among your employees. This, you know, employees who are engaged, when they really love what they do, when they're committed to the purpose of your company, they love talking about it. And they're more likely to refer friends. The friends that they refer are more likely to be high quality candidates. 71% um, of workers use referrals when they are deciding whether they want to join a company and, and trying to learn about job um, opportunities. So in a lot of ways, everything that you've been doing so far has been fueling your ability to turn your people into ambassadors for your brand and into advocates for your brand. Now we wanna just make sure that we're really intentional about that. We wanna equip them with the message we want them to be out there in the world sharing. And that looks like communicating with them often, simplifying your message, being consistent, saying, repeating things over and over so that they really have this ingrained in them. It looks like encouraging your employees to to share the content you've been creating or to, to share the social content you've been creating. It's creating opportunities for employees just to be seen out in the world, whether that's you know, community events or charity things or you know, just a fun company outing. Things like this are going to help build that word of mouth that is so valuable. And so the last thing, finally, iterate. This is a journey. A lot of the things you're gonna try are gonna work. A lot of the things are not gonna work as well as you thought they would, or some are gonna work even better than you thought they would. The point of this is just keep a continuous improvement mindset, right, about your employer brand, the same way you would about processes or anything else. Make sure that you are coming together as HR and marketing, comparing notes often, checking in with leadership every every so often to make sure you're staying connected to that overall uh, vision and purpose. See how your efforts are performing, evaluate them, make improvements where you can. And the more you do this, the more you think this way, the more new opportunities are gonna show up. And if you've done all of this work, if you've uh, put in the, the work to define your employer brand and create this this environment of collaboration between HR and marketing, and you've done all these things, you're gonna be really, really well positioned to seize those new opportunities when they show up. 